Welcome to Money Conversations with KJ. KJ is a lifelong entrepreneur who's made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, and found his way back again. If you're looking for a sterile how-to, you're in the wrong place. KJ and his guests will walk you through real-life situations told by the people who live them, and they are as messy as they are inspiring. Each episode will offer lessons learned, advice on how to replicate successes and avoid pitfalls, and a new perspective to power your financial literacy. Far from a one-size-fits-all, this podcast can help you build a roadmap to your personal promised land. Milk and honey for some, whiskey and steak for others, and remind you that you're not alone on this journey well hello hello everybody welcome back to the show i've got a really uh fun guest i think we're gonna have a really fun time today i have rob cressy here on the show with us today and i and and rob reached out to me to come out on the show did a little background on him see what's going on and rob is a personal growth and he's self and he does self-mastery so he's an entrepreneur like i am and so i know that's entrepreneurs we think different don't we rob by design. By design, right? Not everybody is an entrepreneur or even wants to be one. A lot of people like that little safety net of a job, and that's fine too. But I think today's story with Rob here, because he is an entrepreneur and what he's doing in today's world, helping people, because he's on a mission to help how many? 10 million people. 10 million people. Nice. That's a great, great uh, goal to have and shoot for and always be, because that's a, even though that's a really big number, there's 8 billion people on this planet. Well, of course. And here's the thing. That number first started out as a million. And I actually remember the moment so vividly. So being a creator, I'm very open with the things that I share. And I also believe in the power of the spoken word. So one way of layering accountability as well as vision is to let the world know what you're doing. And I sat there and I'm like, all right, I have a goal of helping a million people. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. That's big. How are you going to quantify it? And all these self-limiting voices of like the the magnitude of this got, I could feel it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do a LinkedIn live and I'm just going to put it out there. And I essentially said, listen, I'm going to help a million people. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I feel kind of uncomfortable saying this right now, but I am putting this out there into the world. This is now in the existence. Well, Uh, one of the books or people that I've learned from is Grant Cardone. And what is his book? The 10X Rule. So boom, I read that and I'm like, crap. You're telling me I just put out there that I'm going to help a million people and now Grant wants me to 10X this. So I'm like, I'm in. I, I believe this mindset and way of thinking. So I sit there and I think one of the beautiful things about the 10X Rule is the belief it builds in yourself and how it helps you shatter your self-limiting belief ceiling. So while previously a million felt big, I sat there and every day I'm speaking into existence. I help 10 million people. I help 10 million people. I help 10 million people. And then one day you're like, you know what? I actually believe I'm going to help 10 million people and I can. And what you realize is that when you create this number for yourself, you're actually just capping the top of it for you. So for me, this 10 million number is not going to be 10 million forever. That number is probably going to move to 100 million because you don't need to know how. And this is sort of fundamental to how I create is when you create a vision, you want to put the vision out there without regarding how it's going to happen. So by design, if you don't have to worry about how it's going to happen, why would we ever think small? Right. Well, I mean, you describe what I, you know, what's what I call manifest, right? You're going to manifest this thing into existence. And I think with the help of technology today, I'm a, probably a bit older than you. And, and I probably didn't have the opportunity or a lot of us didn't let's just say 12, 15 years ago, right? And in today's world that we can leverage, right? All of these different platforms. I have no doubt you'll reach 10 million sooner than you probably anticipate. And I don't know if you put a timeline on it, but that doesn't really matter. We just want to reach people, right? That's the same with me, right? I just began my passion about talking about money because there are two things that people are very uncomfortable talking about. And both of those things are, it's either money or sex, right? People get uncomfortable. They get like, they get on like, we're going to talk about this. I'm like, well, we're not talking about sex, but I'm definitely want to talk to you about money. Right. And the reason people don't like to talk about money 
Well, I'll ask you that question, Rob. Why do you think people don't? There's two reasons why people don't like to talk about money. What do you think those are? So people may feel like it's too personal or actually, you know what the answer is? It's very simple. It is the story they tell themselves about money. So, and this is once again, why, like wiring yourself talk 101. So we attach a story or a narrative to everything that we do. And it just so happens we've been taught at a very early age, you want more, more, more money, money, money. And you look and see the Joneses and you see social media and everything. And, and there's a world of everybody has. So there's a natural lack that people feel around money. So therefore by design, the story they're telling themselves is one of financial scale that I don't have air quotes enough. And if I don't have enough, I don't feel comfortable talking about this with other people because it's going to be a reflection of who I am. Yeah. What I found out was, and people, cause people confess to me why they don't. And the two basic reasons, that's a great explanation. But at the end of the day, the two reasons why you, they don't is one, you either have money and you don't want to talk about it because one, you don't want to be either braggadocious or you're afraid people are going to ask you to borrow money. Right. The second reason they don't want to talk about it is because they don't have any money and then maybe they're a little embarrassed of the way they have been handling their money and they don't have any. Right. So they're embarrassed of that. And so either side of the coin there. Right. Uh, makes that's why you were uncomfortable talking about it. But I find that on the side, if you don't have it, that's a big reason why you don't have it, because you haven't been talking about it. No one taught you. I'm going to ask you the same question I ask every everybody comes on the show here. How old were you when your parents sat you down and talked to you about the money game? So I was thinking about this in preparation for this podcast because I knew this question was happening. And I wrote down three words, red lock box. So I don't know how old I was, but my guess is going to be somewhere between eight, nine, 10 or 11. Like we're talking early on in the journey. And I remember having, and it wouldn't be considered a safe, but it would be a, a red metal lock box that has the little switch on the side. And there's an area for a keyhole, but there was never a key. And I would put the money that I have and I'll just push the little the lever to the side and open up my box and that's where I would put my money. So that is the earliest memory that I have is a red lock box. So you don't remember any conversations with mom or dad and them sitting you down and having the conversation, hey, you you're you're you want money, you need money or now you're making money. Because if you're below the age of 8 or 9, you're not really making money. You're getting money from mom and dad. You want to go down and get yourself, you know, McDonald's or whatever, you know, whatever it is that you want. Maybe you need a new pair of sneakers or something, right? And you go to mom and dad and you ask for money. And so at what point, at what age cuz you have that little red box, but you're saying it's about between 8 and 11, something caused you to to get that red box. And, and that's where you were going to stash your money, right? That's like, hey, this is where it's going. But where did you get that money at that age? And who, who told you to put that money away? It would have been my parents. And to add context to this, I have worked for as long as I can remember whether I'm, sh I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So whether I was shoveling driveways as a kid or mowing lawn or doing mulch, and these were all things that are just like, I'm not working for like a, lo a lawn maintenance company. I'm going around and doing these things for other neighbors. So it was probably the beginning of what would be considered the seeds of entrepreneurship, even though that's not exactly how it was framed. And uh, my dad growing up uh, owned a car wash so I would mow the grass and I would do all the lawn maintenance and I would sit outside and I would sell tokens. And I did this before I was probably 14 years old doing this stuff. So I don't remember a specific conversation, but I also remember my entire journey. I've been working to generate something at some point. So you, you brought up an interesting phrase where you just said that. So your dad owned a car wash that would make your dad an entrepreneur, right? Correct. What'd your mom do for a living? Uh, she was a stay-at-home mom. Perfect, which we all know is the hardest job out there, right? Um, I find, you tell me, do you think, because you watched your dad, not actually, he went to work every day, I'm sure, to run this car wash, um, but he didn't have a, a a boss, right? Like, I talked to a lot of people, oh, yeah, my dad or my mom, you know, they went to work every day and, and they had their boss and we'd go to their picnic parties or whatever like that. But since your dad was an entrepreneur, 
when did you figure out that your dad and not even under the sense of entrepreneur, but your dad was a, wasn't like the, maybe a lot of your friends' dads who had regular, and I hate using that term regular jobs, but you know, basically they were clocking in and out somewhere. Here's the context. My dad was a pilot. Okay. So his job was being a pilot. So he would be home for three days, gone for three days, home for three days, gone for three days. And through the maturation, probably through his maturation, he eventually opened up a car wash as what I assume, I don't know this for exact answers, as a way of creating passive or side income as a supplement to things. So he saw a business opportunity and created that because what is one of the beautiful things about a car wash? It can be self-sufficient and self-run. That thing was run with, uh, let's call it, one or two managers that could be older in age who are very good mechanically and their 14 year old son and maybe another high school kid just to make sure that people aren't running into things, take out the trash. So if you were going to design a business as a, you have a job and you're an entrepreneur, it was one that is a little bit more passive than most. So, you, I mean, you, we, again, we could describe that in many ways. It could have been your dad's side hustle. It could have been your dad at the time, and you, whether you do or don't know this, um, was trying to achieve some financial goal, which where his being a pilot didn't, you know, that didn't uh, fulfill whatever that may have been. Um, did you ever have a, con- like, l- later when you were a young adult, did you ever ask your dad, hey, dad, why do you own this car wash? You, you fly planes. You're a pilot. Why do you do this? No, but I, I think it's, uh, probably opportunistic. So uh, looking back on it, my dad loved to fly. So I think there's there's an interesting distinction in this that uh, there's a job, but then there's the people who love what they do. So you never actually work a day in your life. And of course, it doesn't mean that every day is puppy dogs and rainbows, but it is something where he flew in the Air Force Reserve and then his dream was to fly airplanes back in the day. So boom, he loved actually the act of flying. So my guess is he was more opportunistic in things. So as you're starting to explore uh, what are other ways that you can generate income, because I think this comes with having a growth mindset that you can always create more. And it doesn't mean you're dissatisfied in one, but you can like both steak and shrimp. So how do you think that affected you? Did you think that your mindset, and again, I believe that between the ages of five and about 12 to 15 even, because our maturity levels are different growing up, that uh, subconsciously, do you believe now as an adult, that subconsciously that shaped your mindset on how you think and act with your time and money right now? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, one, it built my work ethic that... At a young age, one, I learned to appreciate money because I valued it because uh, it's not exactly enjoyable in 95 degrees summer heat to go dig some mulch. So all of a sudden you were uh, getting something for that fruit, that labor. So now I could go and buy a pair of Air Jordans that are a hundred dollars and I earned it. So it got the appreciation of that. And I believe uh, this is probably where I started to learn about saving money or earning to save to create whatever it is that I wanted. And uh, I'm sure the entrepreneurial seeds also came inside of me without my dad being like, I'm an entrepreneur and this is what entrepreneurs do. But I think you just learn things by osmosis or by living or being around. Uh, There's a way of being that's extremely important to the way that I see the world is the way that you create yourself and who you are and, and how your being is. So seeing him doing as opposed to not doing. So I am now an action oriented person, which is what entrepreneurship becomes. So if my dad came home from being a pilot and sat on the couch and did nothing, that would be one thing, but we were going to the car wash or we were playing ball or doing things. So entrepreneurship bred action. So would you say that based on that, right? And today as the adult that you are today, would you consider yourself a saver or a spender? I would consider myself a saver. So, okay. And again, because again, just through so many conversations, guys, when we're, you know, for everybody out there listening that we, you know, they have, they have that phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? You heard that phrase, right? And it, it's, it's really so true, right? It's unbelievable. Now, sometimes 
the apple falls far from the tree because it sounds like you had amazing parents. They did an amazing job raising you. And, and not everybody's that fortunate, right? On this planet, not just in the U.S., but everywhere. And so sometimes people have to go and find their path because maybe your parents were the best example uh, to lead by. But um, talk to us about what age do you think you were when you started to think to your or somehow you learned, you know what, I need to make my money, make money. I, I, it can't be me. My money has to make money investing. What age do you think you were when that happened? It's interesting you say that because I wanted to add an addendum to saver versus spender because I would like to say that I'm an investor and maybe not in the way that most people would say, even though it also is. So yes, how you invest and how you can make money into money. But I believe the gift that I was given that makes me unique or a different than most people is the investment in self. And the investment in me, in my dreams, in my ability to create anything that I want. And if that's the answer, uh, that was when I was 28 years old and I'm 41 right now. And it would be when I left my well-paying corporate digital ad sales job when uh, you can wake up every day and be great at something and make a lot of money and not love doing it. And that was me. And I did not wake up looking forward to my job. I lived for the weekends. And at the time, my dream was to work in sports and be creative and to create a life of freedom where I could do whatever I want and create the world in my image. So eventually I said to myself, I would regret it for the rest of my life if I don't give it a shot at making my dreams happen. To me, the bigger risk was not taking the risk at all. So boom, I cut the cord, burned the boats and went all in on myself and literally overnight went down to zero dollars. And a beautiful thing happened then. I got the gift of self-awareness. I realized that everything was now on me, every single aspect of my life. And I realized there was two things no one could ever take from me. So I'm starting at zero dollars, zero connections, zero websites, zero everything as bottom as you can get, actually not as bottom as you can get because that's a different story. I've gotten worse than that bottom. We're at zero right now. And I was like, there's two things no one could take from me. Number one, what I learn. By design, if I learn something today, today is better than yesterday. And number two, my mindset. What's going to help me accomplish my goals faster, positivity or negativity? Positivity, of course, negativity is going to take me further away from where I want to go. Therefore, negativity serves no place in my life. And because of this mindset that got created by going to zero, I immediately saw the greatest investment I could ever make as the one I have in myself, because no one can ever take that from you. That's a great story, Rob. That's very inspiring. I think for a lot of you guys that are out there, you know, you'd mentioned you were 28 when that happened. And and that's it's ironic when you tell me that age, because through conversation between 28 and 30 is when a lot of my conversations I have with people share with me. That's about when people start reflecting. Right. You're you're like you're almost done with your 20s. But so I like to use just round numbers 30 where people reflect, hey, what have I done? And you reflected on your corporate job, meaning, hey, you must have went to college, got a degree. Do it. What the. They call the American dream, right? Go to school, get good grades, go get a good job and then save for retirement kind of thing. Right. And so you had some at some point there, you had a, a an aha wake up moment. And then that leads you into transforming your mindset into what you have today, which I 100 percent agree with this positivity mindset. Um, you know, life can always not be very kind to us. Right. And sometimes it can be very difficult to have this type of mindset in and agree, agree or disagree, you tell me, how hard is it for you? Because I, I was listening. I, I, I love listening to Ed Milet. He's awesome. And he had a great uh, person on here. I don't know, I think it was yesterday or the day before that I listened that, you know, like you said earlier, not every day in all of our lives is peaches and grain, right? I mean, everybody's going to have hard days. And positivity is definitely something I believe you have to be proactive in being because I think life just life, I say life throws us all curveballs all the time. And some people, um, 
you know, there's anxiety, depression, and all these things out there that people really suffer from that I didn't used to understand it, but I'm trying to still get really wrap my head around it. I personally have never had anxiety or depression. So, but I know it's real. And is what was it that you think caused you to have that, just that shift at 28 years old? Oh, it's one word, regret. I never wanted to live a life of regret if, if I had only. So I sat there and I saw what the other companies in the space were creating. And I knew I belonged. I knew I was as good or better than everything that I saw out there. It was almost like a call. It was a calling. It was my dreams, literally my dreams. Everything that I was doing was attached to my dreams. And I had to know. And I did not want to go through the rest of my life wondering if I had only dot, dot, dot. And man, it is the most beautiful gift in the world. And here's the thing. Most people don't realize that they'll ask like, Rob, what was it like when you like made this big decision? The decision was the easy part. Now you're in the game. Now you're at zero. Now you're like, all right, so I'm making no dollars now. Now what to do? Most people spend so much time debating should I or should I not that they're not actually in the game to play this. And I love that you quoted Ed Milet because I've learned from Ed Milet. He's been one of my digital mentors. And there's a quote of his that uh, yes ands what we're talking about and certainly around investing in yourself. And he says, the bigger the dreams, the deeper the foundation. So if you were to think about what you want to accomplish in your life and how deep your personal development and your mindset foundation needs to be, because as an entrepreneur, you quickly learn that success is not linear. It looks more like a roller coaster. And you talk about anxiety, you talk about depression. I've had both of those things at various times in my life. And the challenge in entrepreneurship and certainly as you throw on the, the weight of money becomes you are so in love with what you're doing. You're like, man, I'm, I'm no longer slinging banner ads. I love my life. I'm doing what I want and no money is coming in. And you feel like there's an anvil on your chest. So what you thought was creating your dream all of a sudden became the biggest challenge you've ever created in your life that you signed up for. So, okay, well, listen, I mean, we all, we all need to make money. Now, lifestyles are, I've talked about them. People are happy to live on two grand a month. And there's people out there that want to live on 30, 40, 50 grand a month, right? And there is no right or wrong answer here. It's whatever we, you know, you're comfortable with. But that the fact that you, you know, telling everybody that you went to zero, I'm sure you had bills like everybody else, right? You live in where you need, need to live. You got to eat, whether you have some sort of transportation, it takes money to, to survive in this world. Um, what were some of the things that you were doing with your money or you decided when you made that decision of leaving corporate America and go and, and follow this dream slash passion of yours? What, what part of the money equation, how much effort and time did you put into that to, to, and or goals to understand that it would afford you the life that you were dreaming of. So I love that we're having this conversation, KJ, because I've done thousands of podcasts for myself and for others. And what I'm about to share is something that I don't even know if I've ever shared before. And it's actually going to go back to the question that you previously asked me, Rob, are you a saver or are you a spender? Right? So uh, I'll give a quick snapshot of what life was like before this because you gave a um, view of the American dream of go to college and get a job and do all of these things. I thought I was on that path. Went to college at Miami of Ohio, got a degree in marketing. My dream at the time is to work for an ad agency, be creative, brainstorm, come up with ideas. This is going to be so much fun. I'm such a creative guy. You know what happened? I was unemployed for a year straight out of college, and I lived off my credit card, as in paid rent with my credit card. I was as broke, broke. I was a negative. So when I said that I went to zero when I was an entrepreneur, well, here's where I was in the negative. So I was, it was at the time when the dot-com crashed. So boom, that's right when I graduated. Boom, can't find a job anywhere. So 
going through that and I finally get a job at a fifth third bank selling home equity loans in a call center making $10 an hour, literally doing the last thing I would ever want in my life. But I finally got a job. I share this to frame the, one of the lowest points of my life and certainly financially. I'm in negatives, like literally for a year I'm making no money. But I got into sales, which wasn't my dream, but I just jumped from job to job, which made slightly more money and a little bit less commute. And finally I got good at what I was doing and I found my way into digital advertising sales. And all of a sudden I made six figures for the first time. And I was like, I don't know, 24 or 25 years old, something like that. And I was making $10 an hour like three years ago. So I felt like this is a bajillion dollars. Right. I was like, holy crap, I can't believe how much money. Well, guess what? Then I got really good at what I did and I started to make several hundred thousand dollars. And without me realizing it consciously, I saved my money. It didn't mean that I didn't spend stuff because I did. Anybody who goes from negatives to actually getting money, and certainly when you're in your 20s, being young and dumb, you're going to do some dumb things. But I still had a financial literacy to myself. And I just saved money for a rainy day, let's call it, until one day when I was 28 years old and I said, I want to go on it, all in it, living my dreams. And I looked and I bankrolled my dreams. I, I did not even intend on doing it, but all of a sudden I had created enough savings for myself that I was not under the pressure on day one to have to generate revenue immediately. And for me, this is something that I wanna share with every entrepreneur that I almost never hear anybody talk about. We can talk about dreams and passion and doing what you love, but you don't want to give yourself such a small window that you automatically are like, if I don't make this happen in two months, I'm screwed because you're not putting yourself in a position to succeed. I gave myself a several year runway with the amount of savings that I had. So because of that, I could self create myself because remember, I am not the person that you are talking to today. I didn't read, I wasn't about personal growth and development. I didn't know what I was doing, I was at zero. So I had to learn and do and fail and figure things out over years to start figuring out ways to generate revenue as a creator. That's awesome because again, your mindset as an entrepreneur is so strong and and I want to make sure that we can help both sides of the fence here, you know, because the listeners all over the place and I don't know how many are entrepreneurs or how, how many of them are just, you know, with, with their jobs. But the things that you're just saying here is one, you believed in yourself and you don't have to be an entrepreneur to believe in yourself. You can have a job and just go be the best that you can be at whatever job you're doing. Right. But I think your story of what you thought was going to be a dream job and you went to school for it and then you did it and you just found out, hey, it wasn't what I like. There's that is such a normal story. I find that around 30 people are doing these things like, you know what, that's not what I thought. But I'm here to tell you, I'm 60 years old. Your dreams can change every five or 10 years. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with this. OK, you don't have to do. Matter of fact, very few people actually will do one specific type of job or living their whole life. Very rarely does that actually happen. But I think people believe when they they spent so much effort and time and not even necessarily the money, but I think it's the time that they figured, you know what, I, I got schooled for this. I'm, this is what I have to do now. It's like they don't give themselves permission to make that change. And for you, you're like, no, no, this isn't what I, what I thought. This isn't what I want to do for the next however many, 20, 30 more years, right? And, and more importantly, that it sounds to me like your mind shifts, uh, it shifted towards helping, right? Um, other people. It's not about you. This whole thing isn't about Rob, right? This whole thing is about Rob helping people. But at the same time, we all have to go through life making money. And talk to me about what type of mentors have you had in your career that have helped you within your career, like what you actually do, and or have you had a mentor with money? And how? what are you doing today with your money? So mentors and personal growth and development and learning courses, coaches, game changer of all game changers. And I remember the first coach that I hired, it was a brand coach to help me um, clarify the messaging of my brand. And I want to say it was $2,000 and it was more than I'd 
I mean, I'd never spent anything for a coach before. So all of a sudden spend $2,000. And I oftentimes talk about gifts that you can give yourself. When you give yourself the gift of a coach for the first time, your world will go from black and white to color because here's somebody who is now part of your team whose goal is to help you succeed around the thing that they are experts in. Very similar to you, KJ Boom. What you do on the money side of things, it's like you find somebody who is an expert at that to help you achieve what you want. And then all of a sudden, I just continued to level up my coaches. And I'm like, all right, well, if I have a brand coach, I want a creating coach. And then I also want a systems and processes coach because there's things that I want to do. And then there's things that I don't want to do or that I don't want to learn that somebody else can do better than me. And all of a sudden, I started to find coaches everywhere. And it's ironic that you brought up Ed Milet because I'm part of Ed's entrepreneurship group, the Arte Syndicate, and I've been there since the beginning for the last three years. So I have used digital mentors for myself for the last decade, podcasts, books, and groups that cost anywhere from $100 to $1,000 a month. So not crazy money, but something like that, where there's a constant trip of people who have learned and done it before, who want to share that wisdom with you and boom, show you the roadmap. So that's where my investment has been as it relates to money mentors. There's actually one book that changed the entire game for me as an entrepreneur. And it was Profit First by Mike McCallowitz. And apologies if I butch his last name. Um, and it was beautiful because it taught a structure of finance because I think one of the challenges a lot of people, entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs face is I'm a creative, I'm good at these things. But when it comes to the numbers and the structure side of things, we oftentimes don't have that. So one thing that I teach is uncertainty leads to inaction. So if I don't know how to do a profit and loss statement, I can either figure it out myself or hire an accountant. Well, I hired an accountant, but I came in and I learned the structure to how I can build saving into my monthly inflow, irregardless of how much money is coming in. So making saving part of the DNA of what I do. You bring in $100, cool. $1 goes to profit, $1 goes to uh, your rainy day fund, $42 go to your bills, $30, $30 go into your other account. And that structure changed my life. That's awesome. I mean, you say it a little different than I say it, but I, I just like quoting Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett says, listen, until we learn how to make money while we sleep, we will work till we die. And so paying yourself first is vital for anyone to reach some sort of financial independence. It's just vital. You must pay yourself first. So when you guys get your paychecks or however you get paid, until you decide to put, you know, those those first dollars, wherever it is that you're going to put them. And there's so many places that we can put money that, you know, are advantageous for us. But so you went ahead and you said something there that I think could be very helpful for people that we're all everybody's great at something, whatever it is. But sometimes finances are not in our wheelhouse for a lot of people and it makes them anxious. Right. Money makes people anxious. They get just nervous and they don't want to deal with it. And then when you don't deal with it, it's like you said, right, you're going to go the other direction. You're going to have trouble with it. And so for the fact that you set it up where you knew because you you subconsciously at a very early age became a saver. I don't think that was by by design by you, right? I think you were probably emulating dad and you worked really hard as a lot of kids do going out there and doing the typical mowing the lawn, shoveling snow and all that stuff that to get what you wanted at that time, shoes or whatever. Um, so you instinctively became a saver, right? Now, I just like to teach people, listen, we don't want to save money just to save money. We must save money for a purpose. And we have lots of reasons why we save money. And so what I teach people about saving money is don't commingle your savings. Meaning, listen, if you're saving because you want to buy a house, um, I'm saving because I want to go on some grand vacation somewhere. I'm saving because I got to pay off all my debt. Whatever these all these reasons are. They need to be different buckets where you park this money. If you co-mingle your savings, guys, you're you're never going to reach the, the end goal here. 
because life's always going to throw a curveball at us and expenses come up every month that all of us, if you think about it, what did you pay for last month that you didn't anticipate paying for? Whether it was a blowout on a tire in your car, I had to go spend a hundred bucks on a tire, right? Or, oh, it was mom's birthday. Oh, I got to go buy something for mom. I mean, just every month it's something that we spend money that we don't anticipate that when we're doing our budgeting that we don't plug in, right? Um, you could put it under a line item of other, right? Um, but it's important and vital to save for a purpose and put the money individually in those buckets. And if, if, if you've got a savings goal of a thousand bucks and it's only $10 a week, well, listen, you will get to the thousand dollars. Let's just do the math to see how much time it's going to take. So um, how much in today's life right now with, with you, Rob, how how big a factor is money for you? I don't get the sense that money is not a driver for you. Um, so how much attention do you give it in today? So it's interesting. You picked up on that correctly because I think one of the things that is in undertone that I want to make sure to say is that I love every second of my life. And this comes down to choice. We can choose to be in a job that pays us good money consistently every single day so you don't have to worry about um, financial stability. Boom, that's built into that. Or you can be an entrepreneur and create a life of total freedom in all areas of your life, but now it's on you. So you're wearing a bigger burden for yourself. But at the end of the day, it's all a story that we tell ourselves every single day. So you can choose to live in the past or live in the future or what I would encourage you to do is live in the moment. Because if we're living in the moment right here, there's no reason to feel anxiety or pressure or something because that's just a story that you're telling yourself. And I think about the various um, mechanisms that I've created for myself to build this mindset. So I'm very big into creating declarations every single day, a series of things that I speak to myself that create who I am, AKA the story in my mind. So to remove the financial scarcity side of entrepreneurship, I was like, I'm going to create a very powerful declaration for myself. And that is, I am a revenue generating juggernaut. Because the opposite of financial scarcity is someone who can make revenue in multiple places at multiple times whenever you want. So I show up every single day, boom, I'm a revenue generating juggernaut. And at the same time, I show up as I am fearless because fear is a state of being that is a choice. You can be scared. Like if you see a snake or a lion, you're like, oh my God, that's temporary. Fear is something that you choose to take on for yourself. And one of the quotes that I love is that you cannot worry and trust at the same time. So by design for myself, by saying and declaring, I am fearless. Boom. If I'm fearless, I'm removing that money is a fear that I don't have enough because one of the things people live in is lack and a not enoughness and those don't serve you. And we all are aware of that. So by design money, while I am going to, I am creating abundance in everything that I do for me, I also understand the totality of life that I'm living and money isn't my number one narrative like everybody else, despite the fact that I'm going to be creating generational wealth. Nice. Nice. Again, um, again, there's so many people on this planet and we all are thinking different about money. Um, and money is not a motivator for everybody. It's definitely a motivator for a lot of people. Um, because again, fear, as you talk about fear, right? Fear of loss, right? Um, fear of not providing for my family, let's just say, right? I mean, I raised four great kids. They're all grown and gone, doing their thing, doing fantastic. So I'm an, I'm what they call now an empty nester, right? I'm just my wife and I and, and enjoying life and enjoying now giving back, teaching people about money and helping people with money. My, my, um, my lane is real estate, right? I invest in real estate. I flip homes for a living and then help people with uh, transactional real estate. But um, your motivation not being money at all, what I found is that money will find you. And so for the guy, the people out there, you guys listening that are chasing, chasing, like don't chase. Rob's not chasing money. Rob's chasing. He wants to reach 10 million people. Money is going to be a byproduct of what Rob does. Correct. 100%. It's going to be the value. So I look right now on my whiteboard and what does it say? 
who did I help today? It doesn't say how much money did I make today. It said, who did I help today? And remember, I'm not going through all of this as a struggling broke artist like I was at one point during my life where you're all romantic about things. There's a financial literacy and competence that comes. So actually another one of my declarations, I am financially wise. And boom, I believe that in myself because I have the proof of that. I've collected the evidence that I am wise. So I would encourage you to think about the story that you create for yourself as it relates to your finances. And if it's something that is not serving you, say, wait a second, where is that coming from? And how about I create one that is more powerful, that is true, that is going to serve you because you're correct. Because when you try and squeeze something so hard, man, you're just putting too much emphasis on it but there's a lightness and an airness and when you get i'm a big believer in karma so good in good out bad in bad out so what you're going to give out to others you're going to receive so i'm cool giving it up to the world being like listen i'm here to help others on their journey so do you think about and i know because a lot of people do how much thought do you give or how much effort do you give you mentioned you're 40, 41, um, the word retirement. What does that mean to you? And what do you do to reach what m- most people, you know, strive for some sort of retirement? I don't believe in retirement. I didn't think so. I, I, if I had to guess, I'd say, no, Rob said, you're, you're an entrepreneur like you, like me. Uh, I, even though I talk about retirement because that's a structured way of living life, right? For most people and being the entrepreneur that you are, um, you're not as structured in that direction, right? You're probably, you're structured in what you do, but not towards that. And, and it didn't surprise me for you to answer that question that way, because I'm the same way. Uh, retirement to me means you just gave up, you quit, you're done. And people like you and me, um, are never going to quit, never going to be done because, we're always going to be learning. You mentioned how you invested in yourself and all these different, you know, uh, courses. And, you know, I asked you about mentorship and guys, I want you to understand that investment that Rob's done. I've done almost every entrepreneur on the planet is done is when you invest in yourself. And in, nowadays there's a program for everything uh, and price ranges, like you said, from a hundred to the sky's the limit that all you're doing when you make these investments is collapsing time. Because Rob, you're a smart enough guy to go figure out any of those things that you pay people to coach you to do. But you learned early, like, yeah, I could take the next 10, 12, 18 months to learn X, Y, Z. But you're like, you know what? I'd rather invest in myself, dollar X, collapse time and learn this and have someone who's been there and done that right and get me onto my path quicker you know so i can help these 10 million people so for you guys listening out there really listen to what rob is telling you because he has collapsed time many times and he's probably and you're helping people collapse time because um i forget where i read this that listen we we're all we're humans if you're not always learning until the day you die you're already dead we must learn always and i think you like me We love to learn. Do you love to learn, Rob? Oh, my goodness. It is the greatest thing in the world. And yes, and everything you said about retirement. Here's what I don't relate to. A future date being the time in which I finally do what I want. Wait a second. So you're telling me when I'm finally 65 years old, I am finally going to say, you know what? I love my life. Uh Uh-uh, that's backwards because the things that you can do at that age are not the things that you can do when you are younger. Or you can do a lot of those things, but you're not the same person in life expectancy. I prefer to say, wait a second, wouldn't you rather live a life where you love your life every single day? And to me, retirement comes down to one word, freedom. People see retirement as I am finally free of the bondage of dot, 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 insert whatever it is. But imagine if I told everybody listening and watching right now that you could have that freedom right now as retirement is just a perspective. It is a way of showing up in the world every single day. You could work a job that you love and still take on the mindset of retirement because that's the key is loving life every single day because we are not guaranteed tomorrow. I've learned that many of other people have learned that. So when you want to try and put it off for a future day, there's plenty of stories about people who die the day after they retire. 
what kind of life would that be? You work in a job you do not like for your entire life for the next day for you to die. That would be that that would be horrible. No, that's why I, I like I can't stress enough for people to uh, again, I'm with you. I hate that word. I just don't like that word at all. Retirement, um, as, as you describe, I describe. I think the goal that people financially should to strive for is to be financially independent. Now, being financially independent means when your money makes enough money to support your lifestyle. Now, everybody's lifestyle is different. I talked earlier about it. It could be two grand a month. It could be 50 grand a month. Whatever that number is, it doesn't matter. And there is no right or wrong answer here. I know I know people that are happy on two grand a month. I know people that are miserable because they make 15 grand a month and they want to make 20 and they're miserable about it, right? So striving to be financially independent, whatever that number is for you, is that's your goal. And that's not attached to an age. You mentioned that you're going to work till you're 65. See, that number 65 has been programmed into people for the last 85 to 100 years. It's just been programmed. Retirement is an age. And you, Rob, and I'm here to tell you, retirement is not an age. Strive for financial independence Reach it as early as possible. So now money is not an equation of what makes you happy in life. Money is just a tool. And so we shouldn't strive for having it because most people who have it, I mean, I've heard Ed Milet, he does very well. Um, Obviously, at that point, money does not motivate him. He's like what you're talking, right? He just wants to motivate people to make change in a positive direction and help people and give back. I mean, at the end of the day, everything that we want to do is giving back to help our fellow man, whether you're an American or wherever you live on this planet. Yeah, and, and God forbid we give to ourselves first and our ability to, to live your best life right now when you want to. And guess what? This takes baby steps. It can take decades, which is why you start the growth process now, which is why you and I get so excited about learning because boom, we just start stacking these blocks and then boom, in the future and now, great things can flourish. Well, let's help the people out there with one last question here, Rob. And this is my last question for most of the podcast. You mentioned you're 41. What, looking back now, what would you tell your 21 year old self who was just barely getting started at 21? You're, were you just finishing college or just getting in? Just graduated college. What would you tell the Rob today? What would you look back and have that conversation and tell Rob of 21? It would have been so challenging because of where I was at that time. <laughs> like, very challenging. But I would say, uh, Believe in yourself. You can create anything that you want. That I believe one of the biggest, if not the biggest gifts you can give yourself or anyone is the power of belief. If belief is the story you have, you will find a way to have it happen. That if you always believe in yourself and your dreams, that you're willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen, it will happen. So I I would give him the power of belief because with the power of belief, everything else, financial literacy, doing what you love, you're on that journey. There's purpose. Like you use that word, saving money for a purpose. Imagine living a purpose-driven life. I did not have that self-awareness. I did not have that growth mindset. I did not have that intention. I did not have that belief. At that point, I was just trying to survive. But man, if you can give that belief to someone, it is the gift that keeps on giving that would be uh an awesome lesson to teach your 21 year old self i just want to just i'm gonna i'm gonna piggyback on that word belief you know we live in this planet that's doing a bunch of crazy things right now and the only reason that this planet does crazy things is because of people's belief system right people believe in something so strong that they're willing to die fight for it and die for it And right now on the other side of the planet, there's a war going on because of a belief system, right? It's what they believe. And so we really have to be careful on, I talk about tradition in one of my training, part of my training that, you know, tradition develops our beliefs early in life. And for you, you know, looking back and telling your 21 year old self, man, you've got to get your belief system in check, so to speak, right? And we've got to be careful what we believe in, right? Um, Especially wanting to live a life of positivity like you do to be able to go out there and help people. Um, I believe one of the hardest things for people to change is their belief system, right? If you believe in a certain religion, you don't believe the other religion is correct. And, And to me, listen, I'm 
I'm all about the universe. I'm like Tony Robbins. I'm the universe, right? The universe is asking that the universe will give you whatever you want. Um, so great advice to a 21 year old. I hope a lot of you guys really took that to heart out there because think about, sit back and reflect on what your beliefs are. Are they the beliefs that are going to take you to this personal, personal, I can't even get that word out to be a personal life out there, what you really want to do in life. And don't be somebody else's little drone robot, you know, plugging in, plugging out kind of a thing. So, wow. Um, Rob, awesome words today for the folks. I think they've got a great takeaway from you living your life through that change, that, that, that aha moment you had at 28 that answer you just gave telling your 21 year old self some advice invaluable invaluable so guys listen remember if you're either watching on youtube or you just listen to this on whatever podcast platform podcast platform because i'm on pretty much all of them um smash the like button subscribe to the channel uh you can find rob where can they find you rob it's robcressy.com isn't it robcressy.com or at robcressy twitter instagram linkedin everywhere right All right, Rob. Hey, listen, thanks for coming out. Thanks for sharing. You guys, don't forget, I'm going to have a new episode every Wednesday out there. So uh, check me out, Money Conversations with KJ. You guys have a good week. We'll see you next week. Hey, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that episode. I really enjoyed making all these episodes for you. Remember, we're just having uh, conversations with people's journey with money and the things they did right with it, the things they did wrong with it, and uh, how, how did they really come about getting their mindset with money. So uh, every episode's different. We all have a good takeaway from them. So do me a favor, hit the like button, smash the like button, and subscribe to my channel because every episode that I do is going to be different as all our journeys are different. So you guys take care, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.